So right now, what you're seeing is a little bit of my workspace on Photoshop. And I have taken some time uh, before this presentation to come up with some drawing reference. And when you're using drawing reference, it's important to consider your resources. Obviously, you can draw from life, but sometimes life doesn't sit still. And when life doesn't sit still, you kind of have to have a backup. I know most of you are probably familiar with drawing images from the internet. Uh, what you're seeing in front of you is a collection of the cutest mice that I could possibly find on on a, a free use resource called Pixabay. And Pixabay works on an exchange, which I can really appreciate because I've actually uploaded some of my own photos, which I love to take when I'm going on walks. And people just come together and sometimes you might have to pay for it, so you always have to check the license um, and see what the restraints are. But for this purpose, these were all completely free for use and I don't have to ask for permission. So just so you know that that's out there and you can search pretty much for anything, which is nice. Um, the other thing that I have for references is I have my own photographs. And for this particular demonstration, I'm going to be creating a <laughs> mouse that kind of fits in the Renaissance, but I'm not quite sure yet which which is the right look, which is the right attire, but what I have collected is a series of various images that I took at the Renaissance Fair in Oklahoma. This was several years ago, but I always keep a library of lots of different pictures. My husband does too, as he is also an artist and we collect things together. Right now what you're seeing are various outfits from pirates to musicians to a Viking, and sometimes I like little things like even a belt so or, or a sleeve. So I want to keep all of those and those things are kind of good things to have in front of you when you're looking. Well, before I really get started, I always find it's very helpful to actually just warm up. While I'm on Photoshop, I actually create a few layers to kind of get started and you'll notice that I've got some things up there as well. Um, I'm going to come down into the frame that I'm working on right now and make a few of those layers. I could see my mice up front, so I can quickly just kind of gesture some ideas for the mice. Now, gesture is a energetic, quick kind of drawing that's really focusing on overall just the feel. So sometimes you can just get loose and you're thinking about how lines can work together. Right now, nothing is important yet. I'm just kind of getting my wrist. I'm trying to see, do I like this brush? Is this a brush I'd like to use? Or would I try to use a different brush? And in Photoshop, you'll find out pretty soon uh, that there's lots of different brushes to, to check out. Sometimes people like Skechers. Sometimes people like ones that feel a little bit more like pencil. And when you draw a little harder, they feel a little more like a real pencil. And for some people, that's really important. For me, it definitely was important because I grew up drawing with regular pencils. So I think I'm gonna pick up this draw one. And because I've kind of worked on top of all that, I can actually just delete that scratch pad and start with a new one. And I could take a look at my, my, my mice, my mouses, my mice. As I look at them, I'm thinking about, okay, what makes this mouse like really a mouse. And as they're kind of tall and gestural, sometimes I'm layering the lines and I'm thinking about how I might actually um, get some of that volume, get some of that character in there. I'm just trying to get to know them. And it's okay to be a little loose. It's okay to be free. This is not about being precise yet because these are just really the underwires that exist. Um, we don't see our bones under our body, do we? But they provide a lot of structure. And that's what we want to consider when we're doing some of our gestures. We're thinking about the energy overall. And we're thinking about how is the character going to move based on some of these armatures or these gestural lines. But the line is the, is the critical uh, start, just to make it in the first place, to get it going. So when I start thinking about how is that line going to work and where is that gesture going to go? Notice I'm not too worried about precision. I'm just loosening up. And when you get really experienced over the long haul, you'll start kind of realizing that line also has this great rhythm to it. It has momentum. It has motion. And life has that as well. And when we have that in life, our, our, our objects or our characters, they can actually start to feel a little more real. 
And that's always a helpful thing. Because when we're designing things that are imaginary and brand new, we still want to kind of remember that life is what guides us. We're all connected in that regards. I'm always kind of looking for a midline too. I don't know if you notice that. Sometimes on the face, I'll be looking for something to kind of guide me. Sometimes I'm looking for something in the front of the chest. Uh, that's always a helpful line as well. And sometimes lines can be invisible. Like for example, if I connect that tail to that backbone, that's an invisible line. And yet it's very helpful because it kind of helps define how I might draw the rest of this character. And we're always looking for those invisible lines as well. So we're pretty warmed up. And as I'm kind of gonna go and pick up a couple more, let's talk a little bit about shape. Those were lines and they definitely dictate us. So as we're trying to kind of draw something, and I'm gonna start with this other gestural element of this taller mouse sir rat. And sometimes I'll even layer the lines gesturally, but now I'm starting to look for a shape. And in a sense, that tall rat shape is pretty much a cylinder. I could say that with pretty good confidence that his body has that barrel, but I can also say that, you know what? Maybe that leg has a little bit of that meat going on and I might be looking for some of those shapes as well. As I pull those in, I might look for some flat triangles for feet, and if those don't work, do it again. And what's great about digital, of course, we, has, we have some conveniences. I always call it, it's still like drawing with two hands because I have a left hand for my undos quite often. Now as I piece this tall rat, just using shapes now, and they're still like a gestural shape. I think it's fair to say that that uh, can be seen, that we've got a gestural shape added to this character. And from there, we start thinking about, well, what is a shape? A shape is often a circle, a square, a triangle, and they're dictated by lines. But the second we kind of add, you know, maybe a crosshair or some three dimensionalities to it, then it can become a form. So just to kind of remember that while we're drawing the lines to get the shapes, the next part of the character really is to get the form. And some of the forms are uh, making it feel like it has volume. Because right now, if I were to draw, um, let's say I drew just a straight up cone, like a triangle, it doesn't really feel like it has volume unless I were to add some like line weight to it. And sometimes that line weight might even have some values attached to it. And if I pick up even a different brush and just get something that has a little bit more of some shading into it, I can actually add it and, and get that value change. So now it feels like it might have some volume to it. And values have values and values because values are <laughs> what gives everything that sensation of form. But we can also accomplish that through just even using line tools because line tools are so helpful, especially when we add weight to them. So if one line feels a little bit uh, heavier than the other lines, that can actually add quite a bit of, of depth to a, to a character. So now I'm feeling like these line weights on these shapes have a little bit of some some weight to them. And they get a sense of volume. One thing you probably notice is that I haven't really done any details yet. I'm really not paying attention to the details first. Um, too often we kind of hone in on those things before we're really ready to make major decisions. It's kind of like you gotta make the major decisions first and then you make the minor decisions. The major decision is getting onto the airplane and buying a ticket. The minor decision is where do we sit? <laughs> so we don't worry about where we're sitting until we get on the plane first. So now I'm just kind of looking at the edges and the contours and I have this really cute character kind of started and evolving. And he's mostly this under base armature for my, um, for my mouse character that I'm going to work with the Renaissance. And I'm just going to clear this out right away so I can kind of get rid of that. Thank you. Um, sometimes I find that's a little quicker just to grab a lasso and clear it than to necessarily use an eraser. Because I'm still on that one layer in Photoshop, I can actually start 
pulling out maybe just some of those extra lines in case I want to pull out and clean up. But I don't have to spend too much time on that either because I'm going to be drawing on a different layer altogether. So let's kind of take this layer, which is called layer three, and I can rename this. We'll call him Mr. Mouse. He kind of is a cylinder. He's got some gestural shapes, doesn't he? And I love making animal characters, but I like, and I'm gonna butcher this word, anthropomorphizing them. Anthropomorphizing, I, it's about turning animals that look like people. <laughs> I have never been able to say that word. Uh, and I still can't say that word. I just trip over it all the time, but I could probably spell it. Um, I, if you haven't noticed, I, I've kind of switched over to my other reference now. And as I'm looking at this other set, I'm really excited by all the different um, costumes that the characters have. There's jackets, there's ruffles, there's buttons, there's swords, there's sashes, there's hats. There's all kinds of fun stuff. And as I'm looking at my character, he needs to have a little bit of attitude and he's got to be kind of working this thing. So Mr. Mouse, I'm actually going to flip. So he's standing on the other side. I always like him for some reason looking at me to the right and then I can always flip him back. Um, what is helpful is that if you get in the habit of when you're drawing something kind of switch it back and forth, switch it left to right, right to left and or even hold it up in a mirror if you're drawing with traditional tools that can also be very helpful. When you draw in a mirror, you can kind of get a different look at it and see if there's anything that's kind of off. And as I'm looking at my character right now, I'm pretty happy with them. Um, I am going to have to be a little creative with those boots because boots don't seem to really work on this character the way his legs are shaped. So I will have to probably add some different uh, details and attentions. Now the layer that's above him, and I'm going to just bring my mouse layer and I'm going to kind of make him a little bit softer because I'd like to draw some clothing on top and see what I can do using the reference and I decided to choose a new layer. If you're drawing with traditional tools this can still be accomplished by using tracing paper. It's quite common to actually draw a character on tracing paper, apply the second sheet of tracing paper to draw the clothing and then put a third layer right on top of it and draw the whole thing together because it allows you to see better. I think tracing paper is a wonderful tool to help as you're learning to draw and to see at the same time. Plus it allows you to experiment. So now I got a really tough choice here. I'm thinking which kind of hat, which kind of ruffle I know right away. I really, really, really like some of these ruffles. So I'm going to go pick up one of my brushes that I can work with and I'm going to pick up the sketcher. I'll check it real quick and make sure everything's working. Oh, got the wrong tool on, got an eraser. That makes a difference, doesn't it? Um, so nine times out of 10, you might not have the right tool. Always make sure you got the right one. I like this pirate up top. I really like that feeling of uh, that ruffle that's coming around his necktie. I feel like that provides a pretty strong focal point. So now as I draw it, you'll notice I don't necessarily draw it as I would strings, like a, like a hash, but instead I handle it like it's a giant mass. And if you could think about it, almost everything is still circles, triangles, cubes, squares, forms, still at this point. But after that, I can kind of come in and I could put a couple detailed notes on because we're going to possibly change this or use this. I've noticed up here some guys have some of these cool collars. Sometimes they stick up and sometimes they fold down. I bet for this guy, I can actually fold this and I can carry this and carry that down. So now I've got this idea of, you know, maybe kind of a, a fancy Mr. Mouse here. As I look at some of the different outfits, I also see vests and I see jackets and all kinds of neat stuff. Now at this point, if I feel like I need to change something with my mouse hands because I want to have a different pose, I can look back up and I can kind of say, you know, I think I might do some things a little different. I'm going to pop in a middle layer and kind of gesturally kind of see about what could happen if I were to add a little bit of some flair. And you'll notice that I'm not even, uh, I'm not being critical, I'm just being gesturally loose and I'm working off some of the gravity that I see on those folds that kind of give me that triangle and I'm noticing how the fabric might sway so again gesture will revisit me uh, all every time every time gesture will, will kick right in and it's helpful because you don't always see the gestural lines most artists take that stuff away and you never really get to see it 
so it's very nice to be able to see it. But I've definitely changed his hands, haven't I? He's got longer hands for a mouse, but that's, I think, going to work for me because when I look at my mouse resource, a lot of his hands are just kind of shortened because they're hidden by so much fur. And this mouse in particular is actually going to bulk out when I get done with him, and I'll go back to the resource to see what I need to make work a little bit uh, more appropriately so that he definitely still feels like a mouse. Going back to the clothing, and I'm like, okay, let's see. I don't know about you folks, but I definitely talk a lot when I'm trying to make some decisions. So this is like one of those tracing papers that I can play with and see if it's going to work. And then on the mouse itself, I can just say, you know, I'm going to take away and I'm not going to use the, the hand that I had there. I'm going to open up his arm so he feels a little bit more interesting. If I was thinking about what is this pose? And what is he doing? I'm thinking about, hello. <laughs> you gotta talk to your characters, by the way. Um, I don't know any, any good artists who uh, don't necessarily talk to their characters. It's okay. I guess it's just kind of weird if somebody's listening to you. But I, I kind of have that little sketch over there, just in case. I might need to refer to that feeling of rhythm and balance again, because I'm going to want to pull out some of that in his belly. Sometimes decision making isn't always A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Sometimes it's a lot of stuff kind of all hiding all over the place everywhere. and. As you get better and stronger at this, you get faster at it and you get a little bit more clear. So that's a very um, good thing because the more you practice, the better you're going to get. Uh, I've seen all every artist I know, every person I work with, we know this is true because we've been there, we've been on your side. and. The, the best encouraging words that I can have is just keep practicing. Um, it might not happen tomorrow. It might not happen in two weeks or two years. Folks, sometimes it takes years. But if you love it, why wouldn't you want to do it for years anyway? If you hate it, that's a whole other issue. Now, one of the things you're noticing is that even though I had these curves in the gesture, when I look at the fabric, I notice in the fabric that there's actually some straight lines. So those help me create some structure for the character's um, <clears throat> volume, because if everything was just curvy, and I know that that's not to be true, it's a combination of straight lines and curvy lines. That's what makes things a little bit more interesting. So this is sloping, so I want to remember that whatever he's got on this other side is also going to slope, even though I haven't decided that yet. And I'm going to create the series of curves with smaller straight lines. That's a big secret. Bet you didn't know that one when it comes to drawing fabric, especially um, whether it's, you know, hair can do this, fabric can do this. I kind of look for these triangle shapes that can happen and they'll help create some of those structures. Uh, sometimes we see them kind of come in and they pinch even as an arrow before they actually beller and hang, if that's a word. Uh, your right brain will make words up for you <laughs> as you're drawing. And we got tiny little hands. Now, some of you might be going, hey lady, that, that arm is way too big. I think you need to bring that down. Now, this is a little trick that Photoshop works, works great. So I'm actually going to layer this and I'm going to cut this. So I'm going to layer new via cut. And what I'm going to do with this arm is I'm actually going to shrink this down. And you'll notice it's all my heavy lines. And you're like, that's cheating. No, that's technology. <laughs> I don't have to necessarily be too hung up on too much of the precision. And because that's on a different layer, I can actually merge these layers. 
Those of you following along with the tracing paper and the regular pencils, yeah, you can't really, sh you can't change the size. That's where it gets you. You can redraw it as a smaller scale and then redraw it uh, again, but you can change positions, you can play, you can change angles, but what you can never do is you can't change the scale. That is the one thing that Photoshop is very, very helpful for. So I'm looking at some of these. I like uh, what I see here. So I'm going to pull this character down, this clothing. And again, these are still kind of very uh, much um, uh, the up, the up, the underdrawing. We'll call this the underdrawing. Because as I come into it with some cleaner lines later, I can really define the appearance. Now, what are we going to do about the belt, the drape? So maybe I'm gonna back that up as I make that decision. And let's kind of think about how this could help become part of the outfit. If this becomes part of the outfit, how high, how low is it? Notice that the belt hangs low on uh, gentlemen who have bigger bellies. And then sometimes it comes down below. Some guys that are a little bit more fit and trim might have a higher belt. Our character is pretty fit and trim, so I might actually tuck the belt and see what that does. Now, if it cuts too far into the middle side, then I might bring it back down again. And we will emphasize and play with how the fabric might get tucked into that character. So he's got the belt. It is underneath, but he's also got a jacket on. It's got a vest. So sometimes we're gonna see part of that belt that's underneath, and sometimes we won't see the other sections. So if you notice, I just kind of drew right over it, and I let that hang, and when things hang, they, they have those contours. So my jacket, for the most part, will hang, and the, because I'm at eye level, will hang down this way. But if we were looking up, that jacket might actually turn that direction. So just to note, the way you place those curved lines and straight lines, they do matter in the end. Um, the direction, it's not so much about how perfect and clean they are, but it's more about trying to find the direction that you're in. And I'm just gonna kind of clean up and try to find uh, a little bit more of the character's overall appearance so I could make my lines a little cleaner as we're designing our character. Now, I'm not going to do too much with the hands. You're you're waiting for it, I know, because you, you're probably thinking I'm really bad at hands uh, to yourself because I've I said that to myself when I was your age. I don't know about you, but for a while, a lot of my characters did something like this and the hands went behind the hips. <laughs> so, and if you're giggling, it's because you know what I'm talking about and you're not alone, so it's okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about the lower part. We're gonna kind of grab, and what I need to do is, I have to problem solve these boots. So as I'm looking at this um, up front, up top, this uh, pirate boots, I'm actually going to try to scroll and move that up so I can get a good look at the boots. And they're still kind of dark, aren't they? It's hard for me to really see, but what's happening in that character's boots is how the pants might, and, I think these pants that I'm drawing right now might not make that quite of appearance. They were on this gentleman in the upper left. So now I'm gonna use a little muscle memory here. I want them to be tucked in and kind of hang to create the shape down here that looks like a tri uh, square, excuse me. Because ultimately what my character's kind of doing is something like this. He's got a circle, a cylinder, a rectangle, and then I'm gonna put some triangles on the bottom of his feet. That's very helpful as a map and also a shape language, how they kind of all fit together and work together. So as I'm looking at the, the mouse character right now, I'm going to try to create a series of, or a series of folds to kind of grab some of these booties. And boot feet are tough. Feet are tough. Don't let anyone ever tell you otherwise. They are. But if you break them down, just like any other shape, I like kind of tackling them almost like triangles first or wedges. 
Now, if they start looking a little wonky, which they might, you could still fine tune and clean those up. Maybe it's about the foot's direction. So now with this foot coming at us a little bit more in the front, <clears throat> excuse me, that's actually gonna change a little of the position. Sometimes there's a little bit of an arch and he's got some pretty big feet, I have to say. So we're gonna build those up a little bit just to kind of get that, that mass. And then I'll take my eraser tool and I'll just kind of clean up a little bit so I could see what's happening just around the silhouette. Cause a good silhouette is good for character design. Um, as we start exploring and you folks start building your experience more and more and more, you'll start to see how a silhouette is very helpful and useful. And right now, I'm loving everything about my silhouette except for that foot. Goodness, that thing has got to go. So let's just do it again. It's no biggie. And let's try him all over again. I know that I've got him there. I'm going to take a little bit more closer look to my reference. And sometimes you have to focus. You have to kind of, you got to stop talking <laughs> in order to, to go, oh, okay, that's what I needed to do. And that's okay. And I have students sometimes who will tell me all the time, well, that's how I focus. No, 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 no. It takes a long time to get really good at uh, practicing how to uh, draw and talk at the same time. So I'm pretty sure in class that it's helpful to just kind of focus and, and that'll help you kind of get it a little bit better um, and not just get it in between right because we always want to make our stuff better we're always trying to figure out how do we connect with our personality of our characters and he's got some cool things and I'm starting to get a little sketchy again we're starting to get a little gestural so as I back up and I start thinking okay what else do I need here for my neat character? I really like those cuffs. I kind of missed that opportunity, but I went for the puffy sleeve instead. And I think I need to add some volume to this puffy sleeve still too. As he's kind of put his hand in his pocket here, he's gonna grab his pocket watch. And I'll talk about hands in a minute when I go see the, the cute little mouse hands. Now I gotta find the right hat. And I'm just not feeling a whole lot of these hats. One's funny, one's goofy. This one's from the side. He's kind of okay. So what do we need in a hat? It's got to fit on his head. We know that that's got to actually occur. Uh, let's try something like this. And I'm never afraid to make a new layer or grab a new piece of tracing paper before I really commit. Because you just sometimes need to check it. That's okay before you really put that down. I've got lots of tracing paper still in my closet <laughs> from all those years ago. Ah! Okay. So we've got this little gestural character going on. He is happening, Mr. Mouse. And I'm getting pretty happy with where I'm at with it. I think I can do a couple more changes. And what I'm going to do is I'm gonna combine my layers. All right. Now I'm gonna switch my um, drawing tool. And with my drawing tool, I'm going to a darker color now. So now I've got uh, black and I've got a, th a thicker line and as I'm coming at it I'm still browsing through my sketching tools and seeing which ones are going to work for me the best. So let me actually pull up my wet and dry brushes. And that one's pretty clean as you can see. Sometimes I really prefer though like something that's got a little bit of a taper in it, but that's up to you. Um, as you're drawing, you will decide throughout experience and through time what look you're really looking for. Me, I'm a traditional person, but at heart, so I always tend to kind of gravitate towards that.
this is one of those moments where I'm redoing something. I just don't feel this is going to be working for me. So I'm going to clean up some of the ideas of the boots and how the boots are really connecting with my feet and how that will work. So I'm just going to redo those. And for me, it was really about like, it just didn't seem very mouse-like. <laughs> I was like, you know, there's just something not quite right there. And I think it's mostly because I seen so many mice just have their bare feet being shown and I'm kind of drawn to that. I think that's cute and how the feet might actually come down. Who knows, I might change my mind again. Here's that line weight kind of coming in again. And the other thing you're going to start to see me do is add a little bit more weight to that as I start to address something called values. And for this particular character, kind of need some of that. Because the truth is, is we don't really see the world as uh, lions. We really see them as masses. The whole world is like that. Dark to light. So the first thing I'm going to do is kind of lay in some of those darks. And I'm going to add to it. So now he's got some masses to him. He's got some oomph. And maybe I'll even throw a little of that in the in the um, facial facial part a little bit. Now he looks like a little mouse with a patch. It's kind of cute. At any given time, I can kind of turn down some of that flow even so I can layer it a little slower and start to model it a little bit more. And don't be afraid to go over because you have the power to go lighter too in Photoshop. Now, some of you might be getting a little bit um, harder to keep up with the idea of values, but what you can do is use the side of your pencil, and as you use the side of your pencil, apply some of the values uh, as shading, and then just use your eraser. You can kind of pop some of those out, and it works really, really well. Sometimes when we're doing character design and we're trying to model up clothing and, and different kind of articles, we find it somewhat easier to work with the dark parts first. So like even in the shirt, for example, I know the shirt's going to be white, but it has shadows in it. So I can actually put some of the uh, shadows in it first, and then I can come back at it and put some of the lights in. And in particular, go back to my reference. I'm going to kind of take another look, make sure I'm kind of doing some of the things correct, like adding in some of those hard angles that come in, and simply by putting on some of the lights on top of the dark, I'm able to kind of get that feeling across as if it feels kind of real. This is what painters do. And in some ways, this is nothing more than digital paint. The great thing is, is if you want to come back and add more line work, you totally can. And I'm always, if you haven't noticed, I'm not really up close on the character, am I? I have, sometimes I come in close, but other times I kind of keep it far away so that my eye can really see all the different subtle changes that are happening that I sometimes can't see if I'm up close on it. So now, whoa, that didn't work at all. So I'm going to go try to find myself something a little softer that can work with that. Most of the times when you're talking about brushes, folks, what you're really looking for is the difference between a soft and a hard. And if you have soft edges and hard edges, you can work with those. Textures also make a pretty big difference. Um, textures can add a lot, of, a lot to it. So right now, I just picked up something a little softer so I can kind of soften some of those areas here and there in his shirt. And then I can come back and put those harder ones in. If 
for the scarf. A little dark first. Kick that down. And then a little of those lights. So now we've touched on line. We've touched on shape. We're starting to see volume happen with our form and in our character overall. We are barely touching on texture, <laughs> but I will make it a point to do so. And when we start talking about texture and how we, we apply it, I mean, you know, just using one brush for the most part and a soft brush, I'm able to kind of manipulate it. So texture is perceived texture because technically you can't really touch that and feel that, right? But our eye says, yeah, this has a texture and it would be bumpy or it would be hatched or it would be soft and fuzzy, depending on, you know, what you really think you feel, not necessarily what you are feeling. That's the difference in flat art is sometimes you're creating that, that sense of perceived texture and it's just an optical illusion. And what I'm doing is I'm reconsidering the hat. I really am. I'm debating whether or not I like too much of that volume, not enough of that volume, and really what do I want that hat to be doing with the overall character and how it's connecting. And I think what I'm going to be doing is trimming some of that because it just felt a little too weighty. And what I needed to do was see how the line, remember I said that invisible line? There it is. It flows from one end to the other end. And for me, that's that's pretty important. Those gestural lines as I'm examining the character and how they're going to be placed on there um, overall for how he's going to be feeling. If this needs to get kicked up a little bit more, I can do that a little bit more. Sometimes you do a little too much and sometimes you do a little too little. It can really go either way. There is a certain amount of imagination that every artist brings to the table. And as you're going into character design, the best place to look for some of that observational uh, fun stuff is really just, just take a walk outside. Go see what people are doing. Um, you can't deny how interesting people are all by themselves. Uh, I'm a people watcher, not to sound like a, a creep, but I love sketching in a restaurant while we're waiting for food and, and just observing some of the people and the faces because that's where real life is inspired, or I should say that's where cartoons and real life it's all inspired by is what we see outside and how we recognize and kind of remember people around. One of the best characters I've ever seen in a cartoon was a little teeny tiny itty bitty old lady who had a, one leg was too short. <laughs> so she had a shoe that was super, super tall. And because she had that super tall shoe, she um, 
would 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 limp and make a noise boom tsh, boom tsh, as she walked and her glasses were always falling off her face and she was really really quite adorable as a cartoon character and it's from the movie triplets of belleville if you ever get a chance to watch it it's a french cartoon don't let that sway you because there really isn't that much language in it the whole cartoon is really about um singing and you know the visual imagery uh so to speak and the character design is really weird. Like she's actually built like this. And like I said, she's got one foot that's normal, but one foot that's short and she wears this giant, giant shoe. So it's really kind of funny to watch her walk that way. And then her grandson is shaped like this. <laughs> He's pretty funny too. Now, remember those hands with the mice? Let's take a closer look at those and how that can really work for us because sometimes you can overanalyze what is really happening with a hand and the best way to approach a hand sometimes is to think about it as a square with triangles or mittens. So what I'm going to do and silhouette again is pretty important so I'm thinking about that outer line and how fingers spread apart actually connect a little better in the picture than if they are all together so for here I have them spread apart and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create some highlights and as I try to create the highlight for the hand I'm thinking about how there's a little bit of a highlight here a little bit here and a little here so it'll feel like there's a hand there, but there it's really just darks first, lights second. <laughs> and does anyone know why we, we draw cartoons with only uh, so many fingers? Like four fingers instead of five or three instead of five. Apparently it was cheaper and it was faster. So that's why they started to do that. <laughs> I like using shortcuts when I am drawing on the tablet. When I'm in Photoshop, one shortcut is I for a Mac. I pick up my eyedropper as you're seeing me pick up different colors. And if I want something a little lighter, I'll just pick up another lighter tool before I place something a little lighter. So now we've got some fingers in there kind of getting tucked into that pocket. I'm going to go back to my reference for the clothing and as I kind of look at it I'm gonna just take another good look at some of the way the fabric might hang or how the fabric might create a catch um, or a wrinkle is there something that I can use in my pictures and if you remember I'll put my darks down first because I can simply put the lights in on top. And, you know, this wasn't necessarily a uh, cartoon type of course. Uh, you can find those kinds of courses all over the internet. So <laughs> you can bless yourself and you can seek tutorial after tutorial of all that great yummy stuff that's out there. Trust me, I watch those too. I definitely have a playlist and a bookmark and I watch things. What you guys got from me was a little bit different. It's a little bit about how to really come at a character as if you were doing some life drawing studies and why we do the things and foundations that we do for drawing. We touch on line and we touch on value and we touch on forms and shapes and composition. We talk about masses quite a bit and we talk about how to really approach sketching and thumbnailing. So for this character design workshop, we were pretty heavy about how all those foundational skills do come in handy, especially when you're becoming an illustrator, a fashion designer, uh, a cartoonist, anything you really want to be, you can kind of come at it with anything you want to be, as long as you know the fundamentals. So that if you were trying to do these as a cartoonist, the same fundamentals will apply. They'll just be super, super clean at it. Um, I am a, by trade a illustrator. I like watercolors. I like oils. I like digital. Um, I love characters. Right now I am teaching a storyboard class. That gets really exciting. I've done some environments and the same rules are always there, folks. Uh, masses, sketches, 
lines, detours, highlights, shadows, it doesn't really go away. It kind of comes and haunts you uh, constantly, uh, even in your sleep sometimes. <laughs> I want some of the highlights in that ruffle. And, you know, uh, I mentioned for you folks with digital that, or excuse me, with traditional, that you can still kind of do this stuff. And I don't know if you noticed, but one of the things I did was I started on a gray piece of paper because my gray is a little darker or than my white. And that allows me to kind of add some highlights a little easier because that's how we really see the world. We see the world in light. We don't see the world in shadow. That's why so often you're seeing me put in sh shadows first and then just putting in those highlights on top. So even as I'm putting in a little bit of this detail here, just to make it pop, because the hard edge will, will come forward, and give it some of that, hey, look at me. And as I zoom out, you can see the, the modeling part is the part that can kind of take a little bit of time. You know, how you start to develop your render is, um, something that you work on and that's not something you're really taught you build patience and you build self-discipline and self-discipline <laughs> ah, that's something that's you know that's on you some of you might have great parents who have put a lot of discipline in you so you probably have a lot of self-discipline to start some folks don't necessarily always come in that way and they have to learn how to develop their self-discipline and that's tough. So developing self-discipline hurts. It's a very uh, uncomfortable process because it requires sacrifice often from the things you might want to do. Hopefully, if you love to do art, that's why you're here. You're interested in it. And these are the things that you, this is not even a sacrifice, right? So now you're seeing me put in a little renders here and there, just a tiny few little touches to kind of make things pop, make those kind of fun. It's an optical illusion and I'm almost positive when I say this name, Bob Ross, you probably have seen his stuff and said, how does he do that? Well, it's all an optical illusion. It's not really about how hard you have to draw. It's about how hard you have to see and how hard you have to think about what it is that you are seeing. And in Foundations, we teach you how to really observe the world, how to see it, how to transform it, how to interpret it. And quite often in the beginning in the drawing courses, it's pencil, it's charcoal, it's a lot of those uh, traditional materials which you uh, might have experience with or might not but that's why you come to art school to gain some of that experience with your peers I would definitely say get started now <laughs> have some fun with it because if you can't have fun with what you do then learning will will be difficult for the things that you want to learn that is the truth that I can offer And I don't know if you've noticed, but my brush is never 100% opacity. It's actually at, at about 70. Sometimes I'll kick it down even less, but that's what's helping me layer. It's kind of as if, and when you come to, to SCAD and draw with a pencil, I'll say, draw a little lighter, my friend. It's about drawing light first and then building it up. So by keeping my opacity light, I can actually control it a lot more. And now I'm gonna come in with that ruffle again and you'll see me get dark and then you're gonna see me pop some highlights in. Now if I want them really bright, that's when you can kick things up. But if you've noticed, I've kept things, most things, kind of in the gray area. I didn't tackle anything super bright at all until I was absolutely ready for it. And now I'm just going to kind of interweave some dextral, yummy kind of lines, because who doesn't love a fuzzy scarf? And I'll handle it kind of fuzzy. You saw me sketch with a couple of tools, and for the most part, for this entire uh, value section, I've used the same brush. I 
want buttons. I gotta have me some buttons. So I went back in and grabbed some buttons and now I need to pop in a highlight for those buttons. And it's a fairly hard highlight because buttons are shiny and because they're so shiny, they, they have a lot of uh, hard edges. Unlike the uh, scarf, which was a little bit more of the fuzzy side, if you recall. I think I'm gonna put another button on my pocket. So again, just kind of, I'll put that in there so it feels like it's a button. Now folks, I would have loved to have done this for you in a pen with a pencil, <laughs> just to let you know, that's my favorite material to draw with. It's not always Photoshop, but Photoshop definitely has the convenience factor going on. Time for me to do those feet. Can't get away from them, it's gonna have to happen. So let's go back to the mouse resource, and I'm gonna just kind of look at some feet, okay. Those are some pretty funny looking feet, I have to say. But what I notice is there is a little bit of a kick out. So I'm going to kind of put in the tackle of a shape, mass, and let's go ahead and kind of darken those because he's got dirty feet. No. Pirates, he looks like a funky little aristocratic pirate thing going on here from the Renaissance Fair. If you've never been to a Renaissance Fair, I highly encourage it. It is an interesting thing to do and take your camera with you, take lots of pictures because there's lots of neat things going on. There's a good chance you'll get to eat a turkey leg, see some pirates, I've even seen mermaids. Don't ask me, but there's mermaids there. So if you recall, light on dark makes things a lot easier. So let's make that a little tinier. And then over here we're going to do a little the same. So it just helps me get that dark light mass, dark light mass back and forth with the character. This is very much a drawing fundamental this idea of dark and light masses and we have some other fancy words for that when we start talking about intense intense darks and lights but how we see the world really is is about patterns and we see that from the time we're born dark against light just little notes here and there not a lot of detail, just the illusion of detail. So that when I come in and I kind of think about, oh, there's a toenail there. Trust me, nobody's going to be checking out his teeny tiny toenails because they are not the focal point. And if I draw any more attention to them, then somebody might notice them and they're, they're not that important. They really aren't. One of the things that can help with round objects um, in character design is rim lighting because often things are three-dimensional like his pants they're definitely three-dimensional so because it's three-dimensional light comes around and hits the other side of it we get this idea of glow or rim lighting so I'll just put in a little bit of that change there and then I'm just going to in some of the, the textures of the pants. I'm gonna go back to my Pirates of Penzance. And even though I know that the pants have some wrinkles here and there, I feel like I say here and there a lot. Here and there, a little of this, a little of that.
then again, I don't want to draw too much attention to an area that I don't want to draw too much attention to. So I'm going to make my brush a little bigger. Um, believe it or not, sometimes a smaller brush can really be causing you more harm than good. Go for a bigger one if you're having problems with the composition or any of the details and just see what happens when you do that first because that optical illusion of detail will bite you. You'll think you have to get detailed, but you really don't. It's just uh, just about mouses. So now I've got this, this cute mouse. He definitely needs a name. He also needs a shadow because he doesn't feel like he's on the ground. And I know you're waiting for it. You're, you're asking me, where is... Where is his tail? I don't know. <laughs> I didn't get his tail, did I? But he needs one. So take a look at those mice again. And I love the way this little mouse's tail curls. And there's all kinds of interesting tails. And he's kind of rat-like, I know. But he's also very anthropomorphic. I think I got it right that time. So now, the tail. <sighs> the tail is so unpredictable. So instead of trying to put the tail like on the actual layer of my my dear sir mouse i'm going to put it on a separate layer and i know that it's going to be behind his body um, from the back side it should drop but what i'm also thinking about is how this curve that i have up there and this curve that i have right here are all going to work together so do i want to create some overlap do i want a short stubby tail do I want it to come over to here? The biggest thing is in here and here. I love those. So if I were thinking about how they kind of do something like that, then maybe the best composition is something like that. And it just crosses over. Now where it crosses over, I'm going to be very careful about. And I'm scruffing up his tail. I'm going to put some shadows in it. I'm also going to have to erase some sections because this tail is really going to be in front of him on this part. So I'm going to have to erase some sections. Pretty important to create that highlight right there so that it doesn't feel like it's in front or confusing his pants. And you know what, it's just not bright enough, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go way bright. And then I'm gonna go get that dark again. A little bit of this, a little bit of that, <laughs> if you remember. Just there's a nice Goldilocks rule. Sometimes it's a little too much, sometimes it's not enough, sometimes it's just right. That is our whole existence as artists. <laughs> little of this, little of that, and then just getting it just right. And you will always be your own worst critic. Let that go. Be your biggest fan instead. And see how I just erased that? Now it feels like it's in the right spot. And we've got a tail. So the funny thing I'm going to do right now is I'm going to duplicate that layer. <laughs> got a little darker. And I know I got to get rid of that other junk over there and I will. And I got darker one more time. Now on this last layer, oops, and let's get rid of this stuff now because it's just not, it's just not important. So we're going to clear that. I'm going to clear it on that layer too. And then I'm going to clear it on this last layer so he doesn't become confused. But one of these tails is going to become something else. I'm going to drop it down. And I'm just going to verify that I've got it. Everything's going kind of in the right spot. So by doing that, it kind of helped me see where my shadow could be uh, while the, uh, the mouse uh, is on the ground. So I have the shadow. There that is. So let's copy my mouse again. <laughs> and I'm going to do the same thing to him on his own layer. I'm going to squish him and just kind of verify that things are working. And all that's telling me is that the light is directly like kind of from above. Now that little mouse tail 
And that little shadow I'm just gonna put them together because I can because <laughs> you're powerful and then while I do that I'm also gonna go into edit and transform and let's try a little bit of a of a skew and I'm skewing this while the shadow is still touching for one big reason my light source appears to actually be coming from this direction. I'm not sure if you picked that up, um, but I was very attentive to keeping my lights on this side and my shadows on this side. So as you look at him between his clothing, you're seeing that being documented. That's an important thing to do. Um, overall, I forgot to mention it, but I'm touching on it now. And as you're doing that, that's... Uh, something that is super um, responsible. Sometimes uh, for me it's just such a natural thing to do that I forgot to mention it. Because I don't always have to draw me the, the ball over there. <laughs> Towards the end, because for the most part I have created uh, a good deal of this mouse on one layer, I don't necessarily have to save it as a Photoshop layer, um, but it can be helpful. You saw my gesture over there. I can get rid of him now, and I can just do a little bit of file cleanup. So see how much different those shadows are. I like the new shadow, so let's get rid of the old shadow. I don't need the line work anymore, but I'm going to save it just in case. And I got my gestures, and I got my original nothing in that one. So then I go to File, Save As. Now, when I save as um, Mr. Mouse, and you decide that you are going to save it into your project file. If you are going to go back and edit layers, you have to make sure your layers are selected and that Photoshop is selected. Otherwise, it's like you just glued everything down and you accidentally save it as a JPEG. So now I've got my, my Mr. Mouse character. He seems to be doing pretty good overall. And uh, he's ready to, to say hi.